So for tonight's agenda, uh, we're going to discuss the diagnosis of sleep apnea, the two main types of sleep apnea, typical treatments for sleep apnea, and that will include a hypoglossal nerve stimulator. I'll be starting off and talking about the diagnosis of sleep apnea. So sleep apnea, apnea, the word apnea is Greek for without breath or means stop breathing. So this is when you stop breathing at night. The typical signs and symptoms for sleep apnea most commonly is snoring. Um, and almost everybody who has sleep apnea will snore, especially if they have obstructive sleep apnea, but not all snorers uh, have sleep apnea. So it's important to understand that you may not, you, just because you snore does not mean you have sleep apnea. Uh, another common symptom is to stop breathing. Either a bed partner or somebody that you had, had gone camping with or something will notice that you've stopped breathing occasionally. And that is another one of the common signs and symptoms of sleep apnea. Some people will actually wake themselves up gasping for breath and, real, and realize that they're, they're not breathing. That's le less common than uh, having another observer see it, but that is one of the symptoms that we'll uh, often see in the office. Uh, the other symptoms are because when you have sleep apnea, you're often not, you're getting, your sleep is being interrupted frequently, and so your sleep is not refreshing, not restorative, so you'll feel unrefreshed in the morning despite getting a, what you think is a full night's sleep. You're sleepy and tired during the day. If we suspect somebody has sleep apnea, you'll be referred to, some, uh, to, to myself or another sleep specialist, and we'll take a sleep history, and that'll include kind of what time you go to bed, what, what things are affecting your sleep. And then if we think that there's a reasonable chance you have sleep apnea, we'll recommend a sleep study. And there's two main kinds of sleep studies. There's a home sleep apnea test, called also known as an HSAT, or H, uh, uh, home sleep test. And that is where you'll be sent home or will receive at your home a device that will be monitoring your sleep at night. So you'll put it on. It'll typically have monitors that'll measure your breathing as well as whether or not uh, uh, the actual breath at your nose and mouth and also measure your respiratory efforts and your oxygen levels. And it'll determine whether or not you're stopping breathing at night. Now the advantage of a test like this is it's relatively inexpensive. It's easy and comfortable for you, to, for you to do in the comfort of your own home. And another particular advantage in Colorado is that it measures your sleep at your own home. As we'll talk about in a little bit, sleep apnea can be different at different altitudes. And so if you live up in the mountain, I'll often prefer to do one of these tests at least to get an idea of how, where you are with your sleep apnea because your sleep apnea can be different, usually worse, at altitude, your oxygen levels can be lower than they were, would be if we brought you down to a lab. Uh, the other more definitive and kind of gold standard test is called nocturnal polysomnography, or a sleep, also known as colloquially as a sleep study. And that's where we bring you into the lab, and we do the same thing. We hook you up to a bunch more monitors, though, in addition to the standard monitors for just whether you're breathing and whether you're trying to breathe. We're measuring whether you're, we're trying to determine whether or not you're asleep or not. And to do that, you have a bunch of monitors that are attached to your scalp, to your face, to your legs. We're measuring body position, all those things like that. The Disadvantages of that are, of course, that it's more expensive and also that you're coming into a sleep lab. It's a different environment. People may not sleep as well. A lot of people are very concerned about whether they're going to sleep at night, but I have to say, in my experience, probably 95% of the time or even more, we're able to get at least adequate uh, recording and determine whether you have sleep apnea. It may not be a great night's sleep for you, but we're usually able to make the diagnosis and determine with some confidence whether you have sleep apnea. The other advantage, in addition to the fact that, that uh, we're able to uh, get more, or more accurate data, we're also able to determine whether or not you're asleep. By having all these monitors, we can determine whether you're asleep. The home sleep tests, most of them don't even try to do that. A few of them do, and they're probably fairly good, but they're not as good as, a, as an in-lab sleep study because we can actually measure whether or not you're asleep and get an accurate representation of your sleep. If you're at home and you have a home sleep test, you don't sleep for half the study. The test may say you don't have sleep apnea, and really it's that you didn't sleep, not that you didn't have sleep apnea. The other advantage of doing a study in the lab is that we can actually start you on treatment at the time of the study. Typically, that's uh, putting you on CPAP, one of the more common therapies that I'll talk about, but it can also be titrating an oral appliance or, or actually titrating a, or getting you started on an inspired advice and confirming how that's working. So those are the main advantages of that study. 
Sometimes those are studies are required for insurance in order for you to qualify for some of the devices that we use for sleep apnea, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So the two main types of sleep apnea are obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea. So obstructive sleep apnea is overwhelmingly the most common type of sleep apnea that is seen across the country. It's about 98, 99% of patients have obstructive sleep apnea. And what obstructive sleep apnea means, the obstructive part of it, is that your airway is obstructed. So you see on this diagram, the air is trying to go back here, it's trying to go through either the mouth or the nose, but it's getting blocked, usually right here. This is, this, this is the hard palate, this is the soft palate coming down here, this here is the tongue, and when we go to sleep, we relax. When we're awake, we have tone in those muscles that keep those kind of suspended and away from the back of the throat. But in people who are susceptible to sleep apnea, the, they can fall against the back of the throat, which is right here, and they block the airway. Air can't go through, so you're trying to breathe. Your diaphragm's trying to move, your respiratory muscles are moving, they're calling for oxygen, your brain's saying, please breathe but the airway is blocked, or it's just partially blocked. So part of sleep apnea can just be partial blockages that aren't a complete blockage, but they're distressing enough, your, your oxygen levels are dropping, you're moving a little bit of air, but not really adequate amounts. That's called a hypopnea, it's a partial stoppage of your breathing. Regardless, you're having one of these two where you're either stopping completely or partially stopping your breathing because of an obstruction, either because the tongue or the soft palate are falling against the back of the throat, or both. Uh, in some patients, it's both of those are, are uh, causing the obstruction. That's by far the most common, as I said. We estimate that about 20, even more, as close to 30 million people have some degree of sleep apnea, or obstructive sleep apnea. Now, central sleep apnea, and, and here's, it's de here's a slide, just, or part of the slide also demonstrating that one of the things, and we'll go into this, I'll show you another slide that shows this a little more clearly, the uh, oxygen levels dropping and falling down at, uh, when, you, when you hold your breath. This is you breathing during this white section, during this uh, salmon colored section, you're not breathing and your oxygen levels are falling down. Um, I'll actually go back here. This shows a little bit more detail of what's happening during one of these obstructive events. This, all these little squiggly lines, this is kind of what I do every, night, every, every day and some of the nights, reading these little squiggly lines. And this line right across here, this is your brain waves. And this line, this line here is air movement, and these lines are respiratory effort, and this line here is your oxygen level. So what's happening in an apnea is, Here's nice breathing. This is measuring the airflow at your nose, in and out, in and out, and then it just stops. If you look down here, you can see you're still trying to breathe. You're not being very effective. This is good respiratory, this is good movement to your belly and your, your, your chest. They're moving a lot here. They're not moving as much. They're not moving as much because they can't. So you actually stop, you're, 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 you're trying to move, they're, they're struggling to move. They're not moving much, they're not moving any air at all right here. And you can also see your oxygen levels are stopping to drop. As you're not breathing, your oxygen levels are falling, falling. Here on this scale, they're going down to the 90s. I routinely see studies where patients are going to the 80s, the 70s, the 60s, and they do this repetitively over and over. This is just one event, but I see patients that are doing this tens, hundreds, even a thousand times a night in a severe sleep apnea. How it all ends is kind of right here. This is your brain waves, and this is your brain waves asleep. This is some part of your brain says, hey, you're not breathing, wake up and do something about it. So it wakes you up. It's just for a, it can be just for a brief couple of seconds. This is just a couple of seconds here. This is you kind of waking up stimulated, the alarms go off, you start breathing, you, you take a bunch of breaths, but if you have sleep apnea, this cycle repeats itself over and over and over again. In central sleep apnea, that's where your brain St it, it stops telling. It, it tells your it stops sending the signal for your body to breathe. So it doesn't permanently tell it. It just kind of tells your brain, "All right, you breathed enough. We can take a little break. You don't have to breathe right now." So you stop breathing, 
and then carbon dioxide builds up a little bit, your oxygen levels go down, and then it says, whoa, whoa, you gotta breathe, you gotta get this carbon dioxide out, and you gotta get the oxygen in. So it tend, tells you to start breathing again. I, I tell my patients, it's kind of like, like a, uh, it, it's, you're kind of over breathing and under breathing. You alternate between breathing too much for a few seconds and not, not breathing at all. And it's just, it's a dysregulation in your central nervous system, in your brain, your brain stem, which kind of determines how we breathe. It's just dysregulated and not working quite right. Now, you're not, if you go on the internet, you're not gonna read, find out nearly as much about this or you're not gonna see as much about this in most articles online because it's very uncommon, only one or 2% down at sea level. Often it's in patients who have, got, who are, have heart failure or on narcotics or two of the big causes of that. However, a third big cause is altitude. So the higher up in altitude you, you go, you live, you sleep, the more likely you are to have central sleep apnea. So that's why it's a much bigger problem here than it is at sea level. At this altitude, close to 20% of patients will have at least some sleep, central sleep apnea. If you live up at higher altitudes, up in the mountains, seven, eight, 9,000 feet, it gets even more and more common. A lot of my patients will have a, a mix of both too. They'll have some central and some obstructive. They kind of, kind of tend to play together a little bit. So I'll have patients that will have both and we have to kind of treat them independently but also together. So why do we treat sleep apnea? What's, what, what's, what's the big deal? And when I see patients, I usually tell them there's three main reasons that people come to me uh, to be diagnosed with and treated with sleep apnea and three reasons why we're treating the sleep apnea. The first one is kind of in the middle here. Oop, let me go. Uh, and that is snoring bed partner. The first reason is you're pissing somebody off. You're snoring, you're, snor you're stopping breathing, they, they're wondering, they think you're dying because you haven't breathed in 25 seconds and they've got their stopwatch on, they're counting. So they're giving the elbow treatment and you're just annoying somebody else. So that's the, one of the common reasons that patients come to me to, uh, and to be diagnosed and treated with sleep apnea is for kind of marital and bed partner harmony. The other, another reason, second reason, is because the sleep apnea, as I said, it disturbs your sleep. It's, it's disruptive to your sleep. I showed you those little times when you're waking up. Well, those are happening over and over and over again, and those are often keeping you from getting into a deep, restorative sleep. So because of that, you're waking up, you're being woken up, and, and you won't typically remember these arousals. They're so brief, you go right back to sleep. It's just like if somebody poked you for a second, you wake up for a second, you go right back to sleep, you forget all about it, but it happened a couple hundred times overnight, and so your sleep isn't as deep and restorative as it should be, so you wake up, you've slept six, seven, eight, nine hours, and you're not feeling refreshed. You feel sleepy, you're tired during the day, so it, you'll have all the consequences you could expect if you only slept for four hours a day. You don't feel refreshed, you have trouble concentrating, you fall asleep in meetings, you can fall asleep in dri uh, driving. People who have untreated sleep apnea have several fold risk, uh, higher risk of having auto accidents. It's one of the major causes. It's probably a more common cause of accidents than even alcohol or other substance use. Um, you're often, you'll tend to be more uh, likely to be irritable and just frustrated, agitated, can't concentrate, memory problems, things like that. The third reason, which has really become more, uh, more uh, of an issue and we've become a lot more aware of it in the last 10, 20 years, is heart and brain health. There's a lot of evidence, just reams and reams of evidence now, that untreated sleep apnea increases your risk for cardiovascular disease and, for, uh, and also for a variety of other medical problems. And the reasons are, are twofold. One is, remember I showed you that your oxygen levels are dropping down and your brain, really all your cells in your body, they don't like that. They don't like when they have their oxygen supply continually interrupted. So if, you're, if your oxygen levels tend to go low, it stresses out your cells and they send alarms, they don't function very well. Your body can actually do pretty well. If your oxygen levels just go down and stay at 85%, normal should be at least 90%, 89 or 90% or higher. Your body can actually deal pretty well with your oxygen, if your oxygen levels are just staying at 85%. There are some consequences to that. We usually do recommend oxygen for those patients, but what your body really doesn't like is oxygen levels that go from 90 to 80, 90 to 80. There's just not a steady stream. Your cells can't kind of plan is how I think of it. They just, they're constantly being disrupted in terms of their ability to do their jobs. And so that causes a lot of stress on the cardiovascular system in particular. The other reason that, we, that uh, it affects the heart is because all those arousals, you're arousing again, dozens, hundreds, a thousand or more times a night, 
And those arousals, each one of them, you know, any one of them individually, not a big deal. But when they build up to th that many of them, each of them might be just a little bit of release of cortisol, a little bit of release of adrenaline. So you end up being in a situation where your body is overstimulated, your brains and heart is overstimulated. They're not really getting getting the time to rest. Your brain, your, your, not only your body, your body's made up of all, all these organs and they all have their own needs for sleep. Or if you look at the metabolism of the heart and the brain at night, they're different than they are during the day. They're trying to sleep and repair and recover from all the work they did during the day. And they're constantly being woke up and told in the, being told that there's this alarm and you're not breathing and they get stimulated, adrenaline, cortisol, and they don't really get rest, uh, restorative, good quality sleep. And that results in a whole host of medical problems, primarily, as I said, related to the cardiovascular system. People with untreated sleep apnea have higher risks of hypertension, specifically difficult to treat high blood pressure. So if you're needing two or three or more medications, there's a very high probability you have untreated sleep ap or suboptimally treated sleep apnea. Atrial fibrillation and other rhythm disorders. If you have untreated sleep apnea, you're much more likely have to have atrial fibrillation. Heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, Heart attacks, uh, angina, strokes, all those are much, much more likely to occur in patients who have untreated sleep apnea. And very importantly, if we treat sleep, sleep apnea, we can reduce the risk, if we treat it effectively, we can reduce the risk of those. I'll often tell my patients, especially the ones that refer to my cardiologists, my colleagues and friends, that my job is to make the cardiologist look good because if we can identify and treat sleep apnea, I make it easier for them to treat their hypertension, keep them out of atrial fibrillation, treat their heart failure, keep them from having another heart attack or another stent or need bypass surgery. I can, we can really work together as a team to help reduce the risk. It's kind of like uh, if having untreated sleep apnea is like having an untreated blood pressure or untreated uh, high cholesterol. It increases the risk, and if we treat it, we can bring it down. It's just the treatments are a little different. It's not just taking a pill, and we'll talk about the treatment options, but it, th that, these are one, that's one of the most important reasons we're treating sleep apnea is because of the overall health risks and consequences of untreated sleep apnea that we can improve if we can effectively treat it. It used to be that long you know, 20 years ago or so when we started, mostly we were treating people just for symptoms, uh, and if we, patients had sleep apnea but they didn't have symptoms, I didn't often have a good reason to tell them that we needed to treat it. Now I think we have good evidence that even if you're not that symptomatic, uh, you need, we'll, we'll, we can benefit you by treating the sleep apnea and reducing your risk of heart disease. It's important also to note that not everybody who has sleep apnea has symptoms. So I'll get sent patients who, uh, by their cardiologist who has one of these medical problems or say, I don't have symptoms. Well, about 30% of patients who have sleep apnea do not have any symptoms. They don't feel sleepy or tired. They may not have a bed partner that's reporting sleep apnea to them. So we're now focused on just treating their health problems. Also important to note that a lot of people think that they're, they're thin, they're otherwise athletic, they shouldn't have sleep apnea. And there's kind of a, uh, a bias towards thinking that, oh, sleep apnea is something for people that are just overweight. And actually about, also about 30% of patients who have sleep apnea are not uh, significantly overweight. So you can be thin, asymptomatic, and still have sleep apnea and still get benefits from treatment. So there's a couple treatments. The main treatment that everybody's kind of aware of is CPAP. And there's also a couple of related cousins that I'll talk uh, to CPAP that are similar devices that I'll talk about. Uh, the advantages of CPAP are several. One is it's the most likely to be effective. So if I have, take patients with obstructive sleep apnea, about 80 to 90% of patients will respond to CPAP. Now, not everybody is going to respond to the first attempts at it. Sometimes we have to make some adjustments and pressures and settings, but if I can work with a patient, 80 to 90% of the time, I can effectively treat their sleep apnea, get them down to normal or near normal in terms of the severity of sleep apnea. Benefit number two is that we can get you treated right away. From the moment I see you, I can get you treated within, maybe within 24 hours. Usually with insurance authorizations, it's a week or two, but I can get you treated within a week or two and effectively treated. A third benefit is that we'll know right away whether it's effective. The modern CPAP devices have got, uh, actually record your, record your breathing when you're on the machine and they can give us uh, data on whether or not the CPAP's effective. So I can look, you can actually look right away. You'll be offered often by your, the company that provides CPAP. They'll offer you a, a smartphone app that'll hook up to your CPAP unit, 
you'll, every morning you can wake up and see whether or not it was leaking, whether or not the CPAP was effective, and you'll know right away, I'll know when I check a download, I can make changes to the CPAP machine through cloud-based uh, technology so I can see whether or not it's effective, make a change on the fly. So the fact that we know right away uh, means that you know, from the time I see you after having a sleep study and I put you on, I decide we need CPAP, you could get CPAP, know whether or not it works within as soon as a week or two. The biggest problem with CPAP is it's probably the least sexy treatment for sleep apnea, and it may even be the least sexy treatment I know for pretty much anything I treat. Um, wearing a mask, not easy for everybody, and there's a whole host of issues with it. It can cause claustrophobia, the masks fall off, the pressures, uh, people have problems with pressure intolerance. I'd estimate, I, for more often than not, if I work with a patient for, through their initial uh, difficulties in tolerating CPAP, we can kind of come to an agreement and we can, we can find a way to work CPAP work, work for you. I can't promise I can make it work for everybody, but after somebody initially says, I just didn't really like this, I can't try it, I, I'll try, you know, I could try, you know, I need, really need to try to sort out what's the problem. I have a lot of patients that their CPAP's in the closet, was put there five years ago, I'll see them. And I'll say, let's try it again. Let me try adjusting the pressure. Let's get you better mask. Let's try the changing the humidity. Let's get you different headgear. Uh, and I'll try changing the pressures again. We can, work, we can work with different things to try to get you so that you can tolerate CPAP better. I don't have a 100% success rate, but I'd say it's over 50% of patients who initially say, no way, we can get them to try it. Some of that is me just having the discussion about, hey, even though it's not making you feel better, let's talk about the cardiovascular risk. You've got you've got heart failure, you've got atrial fibrillation, I, you've had a heart attack. Let me try to help you, that, you know, let's give it a second effort for that reason. Uh, another, the kind of, uh, another op main, main option for, uh, for obstructive, and these are both for obstructive sleep apnea, is oral appliances. So an oral appliance is a device that you can see here. It's a, it's kind of like an oral, the, the uh, mouth guards that people will wear for when they grind their teeth but it's a much more robust system. It's not a piece of kind of flimsy, soft, rubbery plastic. It's actually usually a hard kind of piece of acrylic, a little bit thicker, and it covers your upper and lower teeth. And then there's a retainer or a, or a, or a band or something between the two that pulls your lower jaw forward relative to your upper jaw. And in doing so, it pull, here's the, uh, the lower jaw being pulled forward, as you can see in this arrow. The tongue is attached to the lower jaw. There's also muscles in the tissue that are, te are between the soft palate and the lower jaw will tend to pull the soft palate a little bit off, more so with the tongue, but it'll tell you create that space. We're trying, to, we're trying to recover that real estate in the back of the throat uh, between the palate and the tongue, and this helps pull those forward, and in doing so, it creates some space, keeps that, it stabilizes the airway, keeps it from collapsing. The indications for this, it's most effective for patients with mild to moderate obstructive sleep apnea, less likely to be effective in patients with severe sleep apnea. I'd say if you've got mild to moderate sleep apnea, especially if you're thin and you have positional sleep apnea, likely to be effective, it's more likely to be effective. We can get rates up to 75 or so percent effectiveness at, at uh, treating your sleep apnea. If you have severe sleep apnea, those fall and you're overweight, those fall to probably 25%. We might be hoping to make your sleep apnea better, but we're probably not gonna really have a home run success with that. Uh, the, so it's limited in terms of its effectiveness, uh, effectiveness for more severe sleep apnea in patients who are uh, significantly overweight. Uh, it also takes a little longer to work. So there's, I think there's kind of three levels of, of these devices. One is the boil and bite ones. You can find those online. Pay 100 bucks. It's just like you used, maybe if you use one of those for sports where you dip it in hot water, you put it between your teeth, and uh, then you're off and, you're off and going. The, the disadvantage is it doesn't really grip the teeth well enough to really pull the jaw forward. You're not, if you, you can start to get uh, TMJ problems from those and you don't really have anybody that's kind of following you or, or fitting it for you. The next level is to go to your regular dentist. Um, a lot of dentists have kind of taken a course in it and do this as part of their practice. Advantage is there is they're gonna give you a better device, but it's gonna take you still several weeks to do it. It's gonna cost you a couple hundred bucks. Uh, they may or may not have a lot of experience in these devices in treating sleep apnea, and they also may not have a lot of uh, experience in treating TMJ problems that, can, that, can some, and, uh, that may sometimes come from these. They also won't usually run through your medical insurance. So you're going to be paying cash for this. Uh, I tend to work with uh, a couple dentists that do the devices uh, kind of as their full uh, for TMJ and also for sleep apnea. 
uh, on a full-time basis. They usually have contracts with insurers to deal for medical contracts, so they actually will run, the, the device is more expensive, but they'll run it through your medical insurance. They'll do more custom fittings. They're much more used to deal and experienced in dealing with the, the complications from these, which can include tooth movement and also TMJ problems. So I, I tend to refer to, doc, to dentists that really do this as their full time. They have a real interest in sleep medicine uh, and do this full time. Another potential problem with these devices is that they're better at making snoring go away than they are at treating sleep apnea. So you can turn a patient who has uh, who recognizes that they have sleep apnea and is getting treatment, trying to get treatment for that, their snoring goes away, they think they're treated, but they really may not be. They may still have sleep apnea even though the snoring go, goes away. So you may be fooled into thinking that you've treated your sleep apnea when you haven't. This device will not work with central sleep apnea. Uh, the CPAP devices, I would say they work about half the time. So they're not, it's not unreasonable to try CPAP for central sleep apnea. It's not as likely to work as it is for obstructive, but I'd say roughly half the time it'll help or, or it'll be, it'll be effective therapy. If that's not effective, there's a more uh, sophisticated version of CPAP. Looks the same, the same box, but it's got much smarter brains in it. It's called adaptive servo ventilation. And that's very effective at treating central sleep apnea. So if we have a patient who has central sleep apnea, I'll often send them to the sleep lab. You have to go to sleep lab to get to uh, an insurer to pay for ASV, adaptive servo ventilation. 90% effective at treating sleep apnea. It's usually more comfortable for, comfortable for patients who have uh, for, for have central sleep apnea, it kind of kind of works with your breathing and syncs with your breathing. Uh, CPAP really doesn't doesn't sync with your breathing; it just kind of pushes the airway open. The adaptive servo, adaptive servo ventilation works a lot better. Can be used for central sleep apnea, very effective. Uh, but you need some experience in terms of how to set the, do the settings right. There's a lot more settings, and uh, it can also treat obstructive as well. So in patients who've got a mixture of obstructive and central sleep apnea, uh, adaptive servo ventilation works very well. Um, oxygen therapy is another thing. People ask me, hey, why don't I just go on oxygen? This, you showed me how your oxygen, my oxygen levels are going down. Uh, the problem with that is that it stops your oxygen levels from going down, but it doesn't stop the obstructive sleep apnea. So you're still having all the arousals, the wakenings up, your, your brain's still getting these, and your body's still getting these emergency signals, cortisol and adrenaline levels are being kind of, are being released. So it's kind of a good patch if you just can't tolerate any other therapy, we got nothing else. I will often, I will tell people, at least let's keep your oxygen levels from being down in the 70s. That's, there's some benefit to that. It can be tough to get insurers to pay for that as a, as a treatment alone. They often won't, they, they, that's not kind of a, one of the recognized main treatments, but we can often kind of finagle that or some people just pay cash and, and get an oxygen concentrator for five or 800 bucks. Um, but that, that it can be a, a, at least a partial treatment for obstructive sleep apnea to eliminate the, uh, the desaturations in oxygen. It can actually be an effective treatment for central sleep apnea, but to prove it, we've got to have you come back to the lab to see there's no other really way to know whether or not the central sleep apnea has been treated by oxygen unless we bring you into the lab. The last, uh, or not, uh, last option I want to talk about is positional therapy. And if we see in a sleep study, uh, either a home sleep study, uh, a lot of these devices, most of the devices, the ones I use, will actually tell me what position you're in and will tell me how bad your sleep apnea is in different, whether on your back or your side. And about half of people are significantly worse on their back than they are on their side. And so those patients, if they're, if they're, and some people are actually normal when they're on their side. They have sleep apnea, but if they're on their side, they're normal. And so what we try to do is get those patients, that's one of the options, they'll say, let's just try to get you to sleep on your side. And the, again, the indications are for people who are normal or close to normal or a lot better on their side. We'll try to get them to avoid sleeping on their back. Couple devices, the simplest one is just get a t-shirt, put a pocket, sew a pocket in the back, drop some tennis balls or wiffle balls or something else irritating in the back and wear that so that when you roll over onto your back, you'll just kind of be reminded to get off your back. You roll back onto your side. It also helps to have a bed that's comfortable for a side sleeper. Side sleepers usually need a softer mattress like a pillow top or a topper and a thicker pillow so that they're more comfortable, the weight's more evenly distributed when they sleep on their side, so that can be part of it. 
here this picture shows a more a commercially available device. There's a whole bunch of them. If you go on Amazon and look for you know, anti-snore devices, they'll show you that, a device like this. And this is kind of a, 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 big, a bigger version of kind of the tennis balls in the back option. It's a belt that wraps around, got some foam or inflatable bolsters that really keep you from sleeping on your back. So you can only sleep on one side or the other. This one is if you want to spend 400 bucks or so, you can get this little electronic device that sits on the back of your neck. If you roll over on your back, it, sh it kind of vibrates like your phone does. And, gets you, and reminds you to get off your back. It also records, it tells you how much you're snoring, tells you your body position, you hook it up to your computer, you can geek out a whole lot on the data from that. Um, the limitations are, we don't know if you're gonna use it, you have to use it consistently every time all night in order for it to work. Uh, and it only works in patients who really are significantly better or normal when they're on their sides or, or prone, meaning sleeping on your stomach compared to your back. The last option are surgical treatment options, uh, and Dr. Hunter is gonna talk about both the, the ear, nose, and throat uh, surgeries that can be done. There's a whole variety of them. A lot of patients will tell me, I already had surgery for that. They took off the back of my palate. Um, there's a whole lot of options he can tell you about, um, and he can talk to you about the indications and limitations for those, as well as uh, we'll talk about the uh, Inspire therapy, which falls into this uh, surgical treatment options, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Hunter. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. And nice to meet you all. Uh, Dr. Hunter, I'm with Boulder Medical Center. I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. I do a lot of stuff with sleep apnea and snoring. And sort of when it comes down to we run out of options for a lot of these things uh, in terms of the stuff that Dr. Miner can help with, uh, we'll often collaborate on some of these things. For a good example, when he talks about people not tolerating CPAP, people not tolerating CPAP, we've found often have nasal obstruction. So if all of a sudden you're one of those people that's not tolerating CPAP and you don't breathe well all night through your nose, well then you come to me and actually we have some fairly easy procedures that we can deal with that alter the anatomy in the nose and get you breathing well. Sometimes we can even just use some medicines or whatever else, but we can actually look in there and see what's going on with that. We typically do not do anything with nasal breathing to treat sleep apnea because it's really not all that effective for treating sleep apnea. Snoring, yeah, sometimes, but really we're doing the nasal surgery to be able to help you tolerate your CPAP device much better or your jaw advancement device like he was talking about. Um, other anatomy altering surgeries. We're gonna be stuff where we see the tongue and we try to get the tongue further off the back. Well, we used to do a surgery where we can pull the tongue forward not as effective. I don't do that really anymore and have avoided that. Um, most of you know that, well, we have tonsils. Most of you think we have two tonsils. Well, us ENT geeks know that we actually have four tonsils. There's one in the back of your nose, usually disappears by the time you're 25. That's your adenoid tonsil or nasopharyngeal tonsil. You have two palatine tonsils. Those are the ones everybody knows about. But guess what? There's another tonsil on the back of the tongue, and that can get really big. I'm the guy that can take a look at that and assess that and address that sort of thing if that's a big part of what's going on. So that's sort of my job in all this. There are some other procedures we deal with as well, but again, the core of this is often looking at CPAP or some of these other devices to help out before we jump into doing surgery. Um, those are the, what we call the anatomy altering surgeries. The other types of surgery we talk about really, and the, the remainder of the talk will be about this, is a newer therapy although it's been around for many, many years now, um, in the last several years, we've started doing a thing called hypoglossal nerve stimulation. The main company out there that, that uh, supports this and provides this service is a company called Inspire. You'll hear about an Inspire implant. And it's a wonderful company I've worked with for some time. And the whole concept is, as Dr. Miner was mentioning, is as your body's trying to breathe, the chest is expanding, trying to pull in air, but that tongue and soft palate is often in the way. So what we see here is we can have a sensor, and this, this slide's a little bit older because we've changed where we put the sensor, but we have a sensor that senses when you're trying to breathe at night. It then passes that signal onto a processor, which then in turn passes that signal onto a nerve that helps move the tongue forward and lift the soft palate. I'll show you a video in a minute here. Um, the indications for this is, well, you have to have moderate to severe sleep apnea. If you peak at your sleep study, that'll be somewhere between 15 and 65 AHI, although caution, we have to make sure that you're not having too much of that central sleep apnea, because again, that's not gonna drive those muscles to move. It's not gonna work for central sleep apnea. 
Um, the other issue that you need is you need to make sure that you're not benefiting from CPAP, that you're not actually able to tolerate it. That's a little bit subjective. For some people, I just had a patient who works with FEMA. When she goes and goes to a disaster site, she can't schlep a bunch of, ba bunch of batteries with her and there's nowhere to plug in because, well, it's a disaster site. There's no electricity there. That's one way of not tolerating CPAP, where I have people who go hunting or camping frequently or travel internationally, and they'll have troubles maintaining CPAP. But for most people, it is what Dr. Miner noticed is, oh, you'll have claustrophobia or you'll have you know, some issue where you're not able to get that to work. That's when we start talking about this. Also, people for this particular treatment cannot be significantly overweight. Currently, most insurance companies based sort of on data, take a look at about an age I have 35 or below as a good, a good person for that. Um, and then we have to do an airway exam where we look at the back of your tongue and the back of your palate while you're sleeping. No, I don't sneak into your house at night and put a camera in the back of your nose. What we do is we bring you in for a very, very brief anesthesia, knock you out, make you sleepy just enough to where you start snoring, and I can take a look in the back there and see if you're a good candidate for this, for this device. Um, and currently in the United States, you have to be over 18. Uh, this device is being used around the world and, and some people younger than that, but in the United States, it's approved for over 18. Uh, it's approved by the FDA since about 2014, just so you know. And there's what the little implant looks like, this silver little box. It's very much like a pacemaker, um, except this one's for your breathing, not for your heart. And you'll see this fella has a remote control. It's like a little cordless mouse. You put right over the implanted device. You press the green button there, and voila, you're off to the races. Uh, it can turn itself off uh, in the morning, or you can turn it off if you wake up early. Uh, for the procedure itself, we tend to do, we used to do three incisions. That's why I crossed that off. We no longer put an incision down here to put that, that uh, breathing sensor in. It can be put in right with the little uh, unit that goes up here. Um, there's another one that we have to go under the tongue, or sorry, not under the tongue, but under the chin to actually find the nerve that activates the soft palate and the back of the tongue, pulling the tongue forward like it is when you're awake um, or when you're not obstructing. So pulling the tongue forward and the palate up. Uh, in terms of the surgery itself, two to three hours, often around three hours. I never rush. Um, there's a number of surgeons around that do this, but it's a fairly select few. So, I'll, you know, we can help you get a hold of someone if you need to. Otherwise, I'm happy to help you. Um, the procedure itself, like I said, two to three hours. Most people do very, very well with some over the counter pain medicines afterward. Uh, some people take uh, some stronger medicines to, to help with, with pain or discomfort afterward, but not typically a, a, a big deal. And people ask, just like people have pacemakers for their hearts, excuse me, pacemakers for their hearts, well, those pacemakers often will last anywhere from three to five years. You have to replace the battery. Same with this, but this one has an 11-year battery life. I have a feeling by the time we get 11 years out, they're gonna have a 20-year battery life or this will be a smaller unit. But it would be the same thing. We make a little incision, sneak it out, put a new one in, and you're good to go. Um, People always ask about MRIs. You can do that on the head and neck and extremities at this point, and we know that's safe. And you'll see this guy. Here he is getting ready to go to sleep, gets his remote control, presses the button, and the sensor senses the breathing. It sends the signal to the tongue, and if you watch that tongue move forward, that's essentially what we're going for. You can see that there. It opens that airway that Dr. Miner was noticing in the back of the nose and the back of the tongue and gives you room to breathe. Um, people, once they get just a little bit used to this, which happens very quickly, they don't notice it. Um, and we, can, uh, we have a way of, of sort of working up to the effective amount of uh, stimulation that you need to get that going, and people do quite well with it. Um, after about a month after the procedure, we send you back and you'll see Dr. Miner or someone like this dashing gentleman. And they actually, through the skin, have a device that can read what's going on with the device, activate it, and change the adjustments and settings for it. Um, and they'll check and make sure it's working just right, send you off. And usually after about a month, 
to two months, maybe often three months, we'll send you back for another sleep study to make sure it's actually working. Um, they'll work with you to make sure you're comfortable with it and so forth and train you how to use it. Here's the great thing. All that remote needs is AA batteries. All you need to do is throw that remote in your briefcase and you don't have hoses and all that other stuff to bring with you. Um, after that, uh, you'll, like I said, do another sleep study. They can adjust it as needed. It's a very adjustable unit and can be customized for most people. Um, and what we see in the end is a 79% reduction in that AHI number. Um, and that's on average. Some people do much better. There's a rare case here and there that somebody needs to maybe be on a little bit of oxygen, especially if they have some heart or lung problems, might still need to be on oxygen with this. Even more rare, I think you're gonna see occasionally with somebody with, with very bad sleep apnea, they might still need a little bit of, of CPAP support, but that's awfully rare. Also, here's, here's what's the selling point for a ton of people. 88% reduction in snoring. Um, and bed, bed partners are pretty happy about that. Uh, it, it allows people to sleep in the same room again, if they want to. Um, and here's the other part of that, 94% positive feedback. People actually use it. There's a lot of folks out there, as Dr. Miner indicated, that they'll, they'll put the CPAP in their closet after a little while and just stop using it and not tell anybody. We have 94% of people who continue to use it on a regular basis. Um, and you look at people in terms of their use of it, they'll tend to stick to it about six hours a night. I wish I always got six hours of sleep a night, but that's how long they're leaving the device on and, and keeping that therapy going. The other thing we find is over time it works out. Um, and even if you took somebody and turned their device off and put them back in a sleep lab, you know what, they'd still have sleep apnea. So it's not like it fixes the sleep apnea and you can turn it off. You keep it rolling and it keeps working over years and years. Uh, this five-year follow-up data is actually probably out to about seven or eight at this point. Um, and they're following these people and it's been so effective now that we have pretty much every insurance type out there covering it. Uh, you know, Medicare, VA, um, and pretty much I think all of the private insurers that I know of do cover it. You have to meet all those criteria we mentioned, but they'll cover it. And that's it. Uh, we talked about the diagnosis, the types of sleep apnea, the sleep typical treatments, and then you know the hypoglossal nerve stimulation. If you have any questions about this stuff, uh, Dr. Miner and I are both here to answer those. And here's information on how to get a hold of us. Uh, you can call those phone numbers and that'll get you through to our offices to sort of schedule uh, a consult. I can tell you for the Inspire implant, and we'll get Dr. Miner up here, for the Inspire implant, one of the common questions is, well, you know, do I have to have a recent sleep study? And most insurance companies, and I think it's reasonable data-wise, most insurance companies are gonna require that you have a sleep study that's been done within the last two to three years. If this is something you're interested in, uh, you probably wouldn't chat with me. You'd probably actually chat with Dr. Miner. However, if you have a sleep study that is within the last couple of years or you're being referred by your sleep doctor, I can certainly look at uh, the sleep study and decide, okay, do you fit that criteria? Would this be a good option for you? In terms of the, in terms of the Inspire implant. Any questions? All right, great, thank you so much. That was <clears throat> very informative. And um, we do have several questions and we're just gonna start taking these and capture as many as we can and get to as many as we can while we have you here for the next 15 minutes or so. So um, in terms of the Inspire um, and insurance covering mm -hmm. the, this uh, implant, do you need to have a CPAP sleep test? Do you have to try a CPAP first before insurance will cover an Inspire? Yeah, insurance, uh, you know, our data indicates all those things we talked about, that you can't have your you know, BMI over 35 or so and that sort of stuff. Um, insurance will require that you have a sleep study. It does not need to be a nocturnal polysomnogram. It does not need to be an in-office sleep study. It can be a home sleep study, again, within the last two to three years, depending on your insurance company. Um, they don't necessarily require that you've had 
an in-lab sleep study or one of those titration studies with CPAP, but most all the insurance companies are gonna make sure that you've at least tried CPAP first. Um, and the definition of try is variable. Some of the companies will require at least a month's trial, whatever that means, you know, and, and you try it for a month, you give it the old college try and see how well you can do with it. Um, and then we can say, okay, they're not tolerating CPAP. Usually in that period of time though, if you're having troubles, Dr. Minor or one of the sleep docs or technicians can help you with different ways of setting your CPAP, different mask interfaces, and try to get that set up and working for you. Um, and that's usually the most prudent way to go because, hey, you know, if we can avoid surgery, let's do. Excellent. What is the maximum weight for Inspire? Oh, I guess the body, you said Body that. weight. We talk about a BMI of, of 35 or less. So, and that BMI is a body mass index and it's a calculation based on your weight relative to your height. Right. Um, and there's some exceptions to how accurate that is. If somebody's particularly muscly, well, of course, they'll weigh quite a bit, but they won't, you know, they won't be obese or anything like that. So what you have to do is, if you want to go online, I'm sure you could, you know, Google online BMI calculator, and you could input your height, input your weight, and you can see where that is. And for some people, we'll get them in the office, we'll talk to them about that, we'll get them paired up with their primary care specialist to help them get some weight down so we can then qualify them for the, for the implant. Great. So uh, a second surgery then is required to replace the battery in the Inspire after you said 11 or so years. Yeah. Now, is that risky at all for a, a patient here who says that, you know, they're currently 60, so yeah. they'll be, you know, 70 before they would need to have a battery replaced, and what are the risks with that? Oh gosh, so it's, it really depends on the person. I don't think it would be risky at all because that's a, that's a really minor procedure. Even this, even though it's an implant, in the relative scheme of all the types of procedures ENT surgeons do, it's, a, it's not a very, it's not a complicated or risky surgery. But just replacing that battery, you know, I can tell you, we, of course, if somebody's sickly and very ill at that time, there's a little bit more risk. Uh, but just replacing the battery would be a very minimal risk procedure. It could be very similar to replacing a pacemaker uh, battery mm -hmm. and, and heart patients, you know, like 80, 90 year old heart patients have those done probably almost every, you know, every week over at Boulder Community Hospital. Main risks are bleeding if you're on blood thinners at that point, but yeah. you know, the surgery that he's doing, the, the, the neck surgery is probably a little more you know, detailed and that, that's what mm -hmm. has, has the risk and requires really kind of a skilled surgeon. Put it, taking a pocket, that pocket's right beneath the skin. And uh, I've seen those surgeries. They're really pretty simple. Just right beneath the skin, pop out a lead, put a new one in, sew it up, you're done. Good to go. Thanks. Great. Uh, a guest says, both of my 12-year-old boys stop bleeding for up to five seconds at a time while sleeping on their sides. Is this considered central sleep apnea? This is in who? In who? In a... 12-year-old, both her 12-year-old boys okay. have this condition of stopping breathing for five, up to five seconds. Yeah, that's well, not, probably not going to be a sleep apnea. So for an adult, an, an apnea or hypopnea has to be at least 10 seconds. For a child, it has to be at least two respiratory cycles. So if you're breathing at about 12 breaths per minute, um, you know, you're going to have to be holding your breath. First. In the neighborhood, it's also going to be around uh, you know, 10, 12 seconds or so. So those wouldn't be considered apneas that I would be concerned about. All righty. Thank you. Uh, have you found patients who have had choking reflex with CPAP? Uh, I've seen a, li you know, see a little bit, a few of everything. Choking reflex, it, it depends on what they're speaking about, but you know, some patients will feel kind of suffocated or feel like the machine's uh, pushing air in and they're kind of gagging against it because of the air. I'll have patients that will feel like their stomach's kind of getting inflated with air and they'll feel like they're kind of burping a lot. Um, choking specifically, I think I'd have to talk to the patient, see exactly what they're talking about. Is it, again, is it that the air is going in when they're trying to breathe out? And, and that may be just a matter of changing the, the pressure on the machine, the settings. Uh, so I'd have, to, I'd have to kind of suss out a little bit about, about exactly what they mean by it. Some people cough more when they go on CPAP. Mm -hmm. I'd have to suss out exactly what they're talking about when they say a choking episode. Yeah, there was a related question. My stomach... My stomach and diaphragm seem to get very bloated when I use my CPAP. Is this dangerous? 
not dangerous, but often concerning. It makes CPAP intolerable for some patients. And so I've had, you know, I've had patients that have had that. Sometimes I can drop the pressure down enough that it works. For some people that they need a higher pressure on their, when they're on their back than on their side, so they'll try to sleep on their sides, not have a large meal before dinner. Um, so that's, in some patients, we can work around that by adjusting the pressure, changing to BiPAP, which, adjust, which a little more air when you breathe in than when you breathe out. Sometimes that makes that worse. Some, it's just a matter of playing with the pressure, seeing if I can get something that people will tolerate. But I, I do see that problem, you know, every month or so I'll have a patient that reports that. For some people it's a, it's a deal breaker. For some people it's just a nuisance. Yeah. So it's not dangerous, though, not dangerous to your diaphragm? Though. No, okay. no, no, no. Okay. Um, here's one. Some say that playing the didgeridoo cures snoring and apnea. Your thoughts on that? Uh, so there's been studies on that, or not studies, but there have been reports on that. And yes, there was, uh, they showed that people who played the didgeridoo had a, it didn't really, it wasn't a big cure for patients with mild sleep apnea, you could reduce the frequency of events. So yeah, it could be helpful, so, and it's fun. So why not? But, you know, it's not gonna, if somebody's got severe sleep apnea, not gonna be a cure. But if you've got a kind of mild sleep apnea, maybe mild to moderate, might cure it, might make it a little bit better, and you'll have fun doing it. Exactly. All right, do my myoclonic seizures play into central sleep apnea? Uh, only if they're, no, probably not, if you have really low oxygen levels, if, you're, you have sleep, if you have central sleep apnea and your oxygen levels are going down to, uh, you know, to a level that's affecting the brain, they could potentially. And if we're talking about, if you're talking about myoclonic seizures, um, you know, I'm more familiar with myoclonic movements or myoclonic jerks, like kind of just, just very brief. Those wouldn't really be considered a seizure, if that's what you're talking about. Those could be uh, related to the, the kind of the stimulation of the brain, kind of waking up and sending a signal that could be part of that. Um, seizures usually would be more related to um, an under, either an underlying brain injury, maybe exacerbated by low oxygen levels. I have a deviated septum. Will repairing that improve my sleep or have any effect reducing sleep apnea? It's a great question. I see a ton of this. Um, again, a lot of it I see in the setting of somebody not tolerating their CPAP. And we, again, have some pretty good studies that show if you have stuffy nose and you're not tolerating CPAP, that we get better CPAP tolerance if we actually can get more airway through the nose. So that deviated septum is a fixed obstruction. What, it's, it's a fairly complicated answer to a simple question because snoring can be fairly complicated. What's going on there is if you're having troubles breathing through your nose, a lot of times you'll have to open your mouth. And we all think our mouths open down. They actually mostly open back. And when you open your mouth back and you're having to breathe at night, and with your mouth open, it pulls that tongue back. Because like Dr. Miner mentioned, your tongue is attached to your chin bone, essentially. So it'll drop the tongue back, drop the palate back, and make snoring and apnea worse. So if we can get some better airway, airflow through the nose, and some people then need to be trained to sleep with their mouth closed, we can certainly help with snoring, maybe help a little bit with, with sleep apnea, but moreover, we get better CPAP tolerance. Um, and that's for anybody, not just with a, a deviated septum, but anybody with nasal obstruction, um, which can come from a few areas. As it relates to sleep test data, can the sleep history from an Apple Watch or other device be used in place of doing a sleep test? It can help you understand better or not whether you might have sleep apnea. And we're going to see, we're seeing an explosion of this, all these devices, the uh, multiple different, the big manufacturers and smaller manufacturers are coming into this space with these wearables that tell you about uh, uh, your, you know, there's your sleep quality. And also they're trying to start to tell you whether you have sleep apnea, but they are not approved to diagnose sleep apnea. They're more useful for you to say, hey, if, if you do this, if you have a watch that, uh, that is reporting this, it can tell you if you don't have sleep apnea, probably with some degree of uh, help and, and certainty. But if it says, hey, I think you have sleep apnea, you need to see a doctor and you need to get a sleep study. Nobody, nobody will pay for sleep, CPAP based on your results from a watch. You know, if you really don't want to go through the expense of, of a study, you know, uh, you know, theoretically you could get, you, we could treat you, but no, no insurance company is going to pay for it. You're going to be paying out of, you're going to have to get a prescription for it and pay for it out of pocket in order to get uh, treatment. I see. 
Can you speak to keeping your CPAP machine clean? Sure. The best way. And, and what about these um, uh, apparatus that are supposed to clean your CPAP really, sure. really well? You know, you'll get recommendations when you get the device. You should have gotten recommendations or you can find them online. Uh, the recommended cleaning procedures, which are to frequently clean the mask, a little less frequently clean the, you know, the tubing, headgear, and your, uh, as part of your insurance company, you should place, pay for replacements for these periodically too, because even with cleaning, they tend to degrade. The, the rubber, the silicone tends to not be as, a, uh, as supple, and the, the masks may leak. Sometimes a lot of patients that their CPAP works great and then it stops working, it's because their masks and the elastic starts to stretch. Um, but in terms of cleaning the device, you need to, uh, you know, I'd follow those recommendations. Uh, the devices like SoClean and other ozone-based cleaners, now those are more sterilizers, so they'll kill bacteria, viruses, things like that. They will break down, you know, the ozone can break down organic things like oils, but they don't clean it. So you're still going to have the residual from the, from, you know, there's your normal facial, oil, facial oils and moisturizers and things like that, and dirt are still going to be on there. They don't remove that. You still do need to clean it periodically. I have lots of patients that like the so clean though, uh, or similar devices because it's nice and convenient. For the so clean, you just put it in there, you leave it there, uh, you know, you put it in there when you're done, you leave it there, and in the morning, uh, in the night when you go back to use it, it's already been ster. I think of it more of a sterilizer than a cleaner. How uh, often should a regular CPAP user do either a home sleep test or a lab sleep study? Test. There's no right answer for a patient. You, once you've got the diagnosis, you don't ever really need to do a sleep study unless something changes in you. So some people say, do I need a sleep study every three or five years? Not at all. I have patients that I'm treating based on a sleep study they had 25 years ago. Uh, you know, the sleep apnea rarely gets better unless you do a couple things. One is there's a change in your medical condition, like if you were drinking alcohol or on narcotics when you had the sleep study, you're off of those, it could get better. The biggest one is weight loss. If you had a substantial weight loss, it would be reasonable to do it. Or if you had surgery, if you had some other procedure, you had neural appliance and you want to know whether or not you've gotten better. But sleep apnea in general, in the absence of one of those, either stays the same or gets worse. So there's not really a compelling reason to do a sleep study on any kind of schedule. I rarely do them, and as I said, I, te I treat patients for decades with decades-old studies. I, there's no reason to think that their sleep apnea is cured itself. What are the requirements, or how? Sh what are the things you should say to an insurance company to have them cover a mandibular advancement device? for mild sleep apnea? Yeah, it's going to be similar. There's going to be a couple of the criteria for um, Inspire. One is that a lot of them may, be, may ask that you try and fail CPAP, although not all of them. It, it, it can be considered first-line therapy for mild or mild to moderate sleep apnea, especially in, uh, in if it's positional and it's better on, their, better on your side. If you're thin or younger, those are all the things that make you most likely to respond to a mandibular advancement device, also known as an oral appliance. That's that, that's that uh, acrylic device that fits over the upper and lower teeth and pulls the mandible forward. Um, really, it's, I usually don't have too much trouble getting, uh, getting uh, uh, coverage. It's really just a, ma a matter of me writing a good note that, suggest that says that you've got sleep apnea, this is a recommended treatment, it's being used as a medical device, and then sending you to a dentist who has medical insurance. That may be one of the keys is if you're going to your regular dentist, you may have dental insurance. Dental insurance does not cover this. This is a medical problem, a medical device you're asking a dentist to make, so they've got to go through the hoops of getting medical and uh, getting uh, uh, contracts for medical devices, and like I said, there's usually only a handful of people in the in, a, in the, a handful of dentists um, of all the dentists that will make these devices. Only a, a small percentage of them have actually gone through those steps, and those are the ones I'll usually refer to. So that may be that if you're if they're reaching a roadblock, they can't get the insurance to pay for it. They may be going to the wrong dentist. You need to have a good note that says you've got sleep apnea, you've proved it, you've got a sleep study. And, and, this is a, and this is a recommended treatment for it. And then see a dentist that accepts the uh, medical insurance. Excellent. How much uh, average does it cost to do a sleep study? So for an in-home sleep study, those usually run in a 200 to probably four, 500. I don't, I don't know what all the, you know, there's this big deal about trying to, uh, the transparency and what, what uh, different uh, uh, company, what different companies will pay, what the insurance contracts are with different 
institutions, but I'd say start at 200 and kind of going up depending on what, the, what your insurance is and what uh, institution you're going to. For in-lab sleep studies, it's kind of in the 500 to three or four thousand dollars. Again, depending on uh, insurance contracts. If you have a CPAP titration, it's more expensive than if you just have a, a basic study without that. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty broad range, and uh, as with any of these procedures, or anything at time you have something uh, a test like this done, uh, you do the best you can to to try to find out what the costs are ahead of time for you on your individual insurance package and the place that you're going to go have the sleep study. Can you have both a pacemaker and an Inspire? Yeah, uh, you sure can. We actually have quite a few people that do that, and it's not been, not been a big problem at all. Are you aware of how difficult it's become to obtain a CPAP device since the Philips recall? It's very frustrating. I've been waiting three months. Yes, it is. I've had not had too bad luck. I've had a lot of, I've had trouble with people who have the Respironics devices and just want to get rid of it and switch to ResMed. When I'm writing a new prescription for somebody, I've written them in the last month or so and gotten them relatively quickly. Maybe you're one DME, you may ask your doctor to refer you to a different DME provider and they may have a better stock or supply. There certainly is, it's, it's, a, it's a bad uh, confluence of problems with it that you know, one device, there's really two main device manufacturers. One of them, really you can't get a new device from them at all. So everybody's jumping on to the ResMed bandwagon and of course we have with the pandemic, the supply chain problems, those have microprocessors and chips and they're made overseas and they're uh, design, you know, designed in Australia, made overseas. So that, they can't just, up, they can't just uh, double the supply of those uh, because of the pandemic uh, supply chain problems. So it is a problem, I acknowledge it, I can't fix it. But I haven't had problems when I've had, as I said, new prescriptions. I've still been able to get patients a new machine when they need it for a new diagnosis. But if you've got an old machine and you're just trying to find one, um, they're, they're more expensive. If you're buying them online, like through CPAP.com or Amazon, the price has gone up about 30%, and they have been harder to get, but I've not had people say they can't get one. Your DME provider may be saying that, but you might try a different, D ask your doctor for a referral to a different DME provider. We have time for just a couple, couple more questions here. We have a, a lot of questions, uh, but... Um, so let's ask this one. Does the Inspire device stimulate continuously or does it only activate when you stop breathing? And that's what a, do you feel when a, the stimulus is given? Yeah, that's, that's very, very good questions. Um, what happens is, so you saw the guy with the remote control, you turn it on at night, usually gives you some time to fall asleep and that's set, you, the, the sleep doctor can set that and that timer. So after about 20 minutes, it turns itself on. And there is an initial period of where people get used to it. Um, I've never heard anybody say it's, it's uncomfortable or painful. It's just a little funny feeling your tongue twitch without you telling it to. Um, but once people are asleep, they tend not to notice it. And what we'll do is over a little period of time, over that first month they're using it, there's a dial on there, essentially a little clicker on there. You can turn up the amount of stimulation of the tongue as you go, and so as you get used to it, every week you click it up a little more, or cl click it up a little more, till you get to that goal amount of stimulation for it. Um, and I think most people talk about, yeah, it's a funny twitching feeling when you're not used to it. Uh, but again, with 94% of people tolerating it well, I haven't really seen many or any people that haven't gotten used to it and can't sleep well with it. Um, it turns itself off at about seven hours. Again, that's a timer that's settable. Um, or if you get up and go let the dog out, uh, you can actually pause it, go to let the dog out, go to the bathroom, what you have to do, and then go back to bed, and it'll turn itself on automatically. What was the second part of that question? Oh, uh, let's see. Another advantage of that oh. is a fun party trick. Pretty much all my patients that have it will usually try it during the daytime. You know, yeah. they'll bring it into the office, they'll show their friends, hey, watch this, oh, and their tongue yeah. kind of sticks out a little bit, they think it's funny, so yeah. it's a fun party trick. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, I think that was the second part of... Okay. Um, you know, that, that question is, uh, what do you feel when the stimulus yeah. is given? You, just kind of, you kind of talk like this, and uh, your, your tongue's kind of sticking out, and it's, it's kind of, yeah. they, they kind of they're, they're smiling while they're doing it when they bring it into the office. I have a dog whose tongue sticks out like that all the time. Um, <laughs> how many uh, Inspire implants have you uh, oh boy. done, doctor? I've been doing them for three, four years. I don't know exactly how many. Um, it's getting more and more common. Uh, because right now all the insurance companies are approving it. Um, top of my head, 50 plus, 
probably not quite 100. Um, the one nice thing about it is I do other implants. I do cochlear implants. I do head and neck reconstruction, trauma reconstruction, cancer reconstruction, cancer surgeries. Of all those surgeries I do, um, I don't know if this is really the simplest, but probably has some of the lowest risk because we're not going into really any deep structures. I'm not near any scary blood vessels. I'm not near any scary nerves. Um, I, we really don't see infections with this. Of course, it's, it's possible, but we really don't um, very often. And so of all the things we do in our, in our practices, this one's, this one's relatively simple. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. So thank you, Dr. Hunter and, and Dr. Miner. We really appreciate your time and expertise this evening. Um, so we have come to the end of our time tonight. A recording of tonight's lecture uh, will be available at bch.org backslash live stream. Uh, we archive all of these lectures, so if you want to go back and take another look, another listen, uh, please uh, do that. You'll also receive a post-lecture survey by email. Please take a minute to fill this out. The hospital is very interested in your input. And again, please remember to visit bch.org for information on the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you for joining us, and have a nice night.